And that's Shabani Keshev with the song Kiana Hey, And if you want to see that unplugged video, hear more of her music, and learn more about her before her appearance in Toronto at the Masala Mindy Masti Festival next Saturday, go to her really well-organized website at www.shabanikashup.com. And Shabani is spelled S-H-I-B-A-N-I, Kashup, K-A-S-H-Y-A-P. So Shabani Kashup is one word, dot com. And before we hear more about the festival, a reminder, you're listening to Masala Canada here at Radio Canada International. I'm Vojtik Jasta. Our program is heard at this time in India, South Asia, and around the world on shortwave in Canada. We're also on Sirius Satellite Radio Channel 95, and 24 hours a day you can hear our program on our webpage at rcinet.ca slash masala. And now let's talk about Masala Mindy Masti, a festival that came out of the discussion of two people, Jyoti Rana and Abhishek Mathur, who would eventually marry, but initially just shared some of the same ideas about bringing contemporary realities to the South Asian community in Toronto. The discussion started in 2000, and the festival started in 2001 and has grown and grown. And throughout all these years and all the multitude of activities for the thousands upon thousands of visitors, the festival has been a free event, a weekend of music, dance, film, theater, workshops, and much more. Last Thursday, I spoke about the festival with Jyoti Rana, the co-founder and the director of operations for the festival, Masala Mendi Masti. Do you remember the first time that the idea of the festival actually was discussed and that you were aware of, oh, okay, hmm, we could start this festival? Yeah. We actually haven't haven't actually thought about that one for a while, but... um, I know that, I mean, I've been born and raised in Toronto my whole life. I'm a purebred Toronto child. You know, I remember growing up and going to South Asian functions. And in fact, it wasn't even South Asian a function at that time. It would be either a Punjabi event or a Gujarati event or something else. But it was, you know, very, very focused subculture within the South Asian culture. And it would be, you know, in the community centers, in the suburbs, things like that. And, and I think I was so well informed of what was happening in South Asia at that time, I used to wonder, I'd say, you know what, there's so many great things that are happening out there that we don't really know about here. And uh, I find it very, very odd. And when I ended up meeting Abhishek, it's a conversation that we ended up having as well. And he had been studying here at York. And he, I remember him telling me once, because, you know, my culture shock coming here were the South Asians and, and the thought process here, the South Asians, because they didn't realize how far advanced you know, India and all had become. Because Abhishek was born in India. He was born in India, you know, and uh, he had this great relationship out there. He goes, you know, we hardly used to speak Hindi out there. We used to speak English all the time. He goes, I don't even think in Hindi. And when we came here, there was such a focus on being, you know, South Asian, South Asian, South Asian, but it was on what was probably the the expected ideas of what it is being South Asian. And, um, you know, we both realized, we said, you know, why not give it an opportunity to come out to the fore? And the best way for that to happen is to put it out in the mainstream public eye and get the media involved and let them see what it's all about. And it's not something that just has to come through Madonna, you know, and her like for Henna, for example. And he's a brilliant mind, and he, he, he came up with all of these thoughts and ideas, and, and it, just started, it just started really, really quickly snowballing from there. You know, we knew we wanted it downtown. We knew that we wanted to be able to have, you know, classical, well-known artists mixing with emerging talent. And we wanted to have parents, you know, turn around and say, you know what, okay, it is okay for my child to become a classical sitarist or a classical tabla player or to become a dancer. They don't have to be a doctor or a lawyer. And, you know, they can make a living out of this. And uh, we wanted to create something really wonderful that our, that our new generations that were coming up would look at and say, you know what, hey guys, you know, and tell all their non-South Asian friends, hey guys, I really want you to come out. I want you to see this festival that we do. Come and see what we're all about. And we worked really hard to maintaining that. So it was a long time ago, but um, I think, you know, I think it's worked out really well. When you say a long time ago, we're talking what, the beginning of uh, like 2001, I guess. Well, 2000, I think. 2001 yeah. was the very first festival. And uh, we tried, you know, we tried working on it back and, and we tried the process back in 2000 and, and, you know, getting the community involved and things like that. And at that time, it was really difficult because, you know, you're in a situation where you've got the old guard that's in town that have been doing things their way for the longest time. 
And then, you know, here come up these two 20-somethings who then turn around and say, but you know what, let's try something new <laughs> and different and uh, try to do it in, in, in another way. And was there resistance to, to this when you, when you started in the first years? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there was. It wasn't very easy to pull in the entire community together to work together because for so long they've had a tried and true method where they would celebrate their own little subcultures, you know, wherever they wanted to do it. And and to get everybody to work together and, and to say, you know what, submit, let's, let's do something together, let's work as partners. Um, it's, a, it's like something that you start at any time. Whenever you try to get people to do things a little differently, there's always a little bit of resistance. But it, it's worked out well. I mean, after our very first year, we had 25,000 people who attended on the weekend, and we thought, oh, my God, yay, look, what a success. And at the end of it, we had elders who came to us and literally put their hand on our heads and gave us their blessings and said, you know what, you guys have done a great job, and we're really happy about that. And, that, and um, has, have they continued to be happy with what you're doing? Absolutely, absolutely. I think one of the things that we're really proud of is that at the festival, we try to push the envelope a little bit. You know, we discuss things that are, chances are not going to be discussed at home. You know, we'll discuss gay rights, or we'll discuss abuse in the home, or we'll discuss anything like that. And one of the things we were really happy was walking into one of the workshops and seminars at the festival a couple of years ago and seeing, to give you some imagination on it, was to see the white hair that was in the room and to see that the elders were also sitting there with us and having this conversation and we were really happy about that because it meant that the conversation was going beyond the current generation. And these conversations, which, you know, were kind of get shoved under the carpet, the closed-door atmosphere about these conversations, were now being people were actually moving into the room to hear this conversation. And we were really, really happy about that. So, yeah, throughout the years, we've had a lot of wonderful reactions from the community.